So let's turn now to an example in the New Testament of Jesus who ran across a funeral presentation. And we think about expectations maybe that come out. But remember, I said at the beginning of the service, I want you to think about these words and see if you can find words in there that have expectation with them. So here we are, Luke chapter 7. So Luke chapter 7 says this. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and, the, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the bier they that they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still, and he said, Young man, I say to you, get up. And the dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother, and they were filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared to us, they said. Jesus has come to help his people. The news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Did you catch a few spots in there that carried some weight of expectation? Well, we'll talk about uh, some of those as well. So here's the Bible story that, uh, that Jesus comes up to this coffin and he tells them to stop and, and they stop. What happens prior to this was that Jesus had just finished a different miracle. There was a centurion that had a worker that that Jesus healed, and it was stirring up a lot of attention. So Jesus had a, had a crowd that was following him. So there's the crowd that was following Jesus. There was an expectation that was coming along with the crowd. Think to yourself, what is the crowd that follows Jesus, what were they expecting? What were they thinking might happen next? What did they want to happen next? What were, th what were they expecting? Because they stopped their lives and they followed Jesus. Must have had some expectation, right? The expectation of, what's he going to do next? And I've, I can't walk away from it. I've got to see. What's he going to do next? The next portion of expectation, I would say, is the fact that Jesus walks up to this casket, stops the procession, and he says to the woman, don't cry. I think those words have some expectation to them. What might be the expectation? Well, think about it. The expectation might be more than just if a friend says don't cry, but if Jesus says don't cry, he's probably going to give you a reason not to cry. Don't cry. And then one more thing. Jesus walks over to that casket, and he speaks to the dead man, and he says, get up. Now there's some expectation. The expectation is, on Jesus' part, that he's going to, that he's going to get up. Okay, tell me, here's a question for you, so put your thinking caps on. How many people did Jesus raise? So give me a number, not including himself. How many people did Jesus raise? I heard three. It was my wife. We're not sure if she's right. But she is. 
The number three is correct. So can you tell me who were those other two? Lazarus is one, and then Jairus' daughter. Yes, so we have, we have these pre, uh, three people that Jesus raised. Um, if you follow the chronology of Luke, this is the first one. So they'd never seen this before. They couldn't even imagine this before. He's going to talk to the dead guy, and the dead guy is going to get up. If we're following tiers of expectation, we have expectation. When a person dies, the Christian faith has expectation. Our expectation is that that person is going to live again. That person who has put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, as promised by him, is going to live again. This was a message is going to teach firsthand and help them to understand that Jesus is the giver of life. And we can have those tears of ex, uh, expectation and, uh, and, and fully know that they are true. This is one place where he begins to teach that lesson for us. The picture is a person with their heart open. I think that the artist of this picture is trying to express the thought of compassion, how, how our heart is, is opened up. You see, that's the thought of the New Testament when it uses the word compassion. And, and when Jesus approached this funeral procession, the Bible tells us about his compassion, how his, how his heart was just opened up. And imagine that this woman has lost her husband. And, and without Medicaid, Medicare, or Social Security, that was going to be difficult. But she at least had a son. And the son maybe could give her some hope that the son would be able to take it. And then she loses her son as well. Can you imagine the tears that she's feeling? And Jesus, knowing all this as this procession is going forward, could, could feel the sorrow in the air. Now, realize there's two groups, two large groups. Jesus had just healed this centurion's worker and started to gather a crowd and the crowd was following him and they came across another crowd. That crowd was a funeral procession. And notice how those two crowds clash. One of them is all about excitement and the other is not. One is all about hope and what's going to happen next. The other one isn't feeling a lot of hope and doesn't really look forward to what happens next. You see how there is a, a clash and opposition and, and Jesus takes these two crowds and melds them into one so that both of these crowds have identical thoughts as he brings these two crowds together with the thought of life, with the thought of hope, with the thought of joy. That's what's going to happen when Jesus sees the heart, uh, his heart is exposed and, and sees this sorrow. So how do some people feel when they're faced with death? Well, some people feel as if, and, and I've heard this, maybe you too, frustration that some people have, have lived their whole life and worked to attain certain goals, and now, because of health and for one reason or another, that's all over. Everything that their earthly life was trying to attain is gone. Now that's gone. And, and, and like Solomon spoke of, in, in, uh, in his book of Proverbs as, as he says that life can sometimes feel meaningless. What is it that we're working for? 
and we toil and we put in long hours and we work and work and, and try to attain a goal and only, only to put it down and walk away from it and who knows what happens after we're gone. Life can just seem like blah, blah, blah. Hopeless, even. Somehow, well, some people will look to death and, and feel as if it is meaningless. And that might bring a tear. Might bring a tear to our, to our eyes. What do we expect from death? That one crowd that was walking along, what did they expect? They expected that this person was going to stay dead. That's not an unreasonable expectation. They expected that this was going to be one of the hardest and di most difficult days of their life. They expected that. And to some degree, they expect death because it happens around us all the time. We should just realize it's just part of life. It's an expectation. Don't let your heart think otherwise. And it brings a tear to our eye. We think to ourselves in such positive ways that that'll never happen to me. I'm going to live long. I might live to a hundred. I might attain my, my goals in life. I'm going to have some degree of success. I'm going to have some degree of love. But when our expectations aren't met and our plans have to change, that sometimes brings those crushing moments. Certainly that was true, I think, with this woman of Nain. She had plans with a husband, and now those were gone. She maybe then had to twist some of her plans to maybe surrounding her son, and now, and now those were gone, and her expectations were crushed. Jesus comes to her and he says, don't cry. There is a, there's a children's book that's entitled, Please Don't Cry. It was written by a mom who had a child that was had a very difficult time calming down at night and going to sleep. So every night at bedtime was crying. And so this book was a book to help to please calm down. Please don't cry. And there's 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 almost some pleading in there to the child, please don't. But that's not the tone that Jesus used in a pleading sort of way. Jesus words of don't cry were meant to be motivational. Were meant to be uplifting we're meant to give some form of expectation because there's a reason not to cry. Because he is the life giver. He is the one who, who is going to bring these two processions and to merge them into one. The procession that was all about joy and happiness combining with, this, with the procession that was all about sorrow and grief. And Jesus changed all that. And he gives us the opportunity to realize he'll do that for me too. He's going to do that with the funeral processions that we are a part of. He's going to help us to see that, that our tears can be tears of expectation. And that points us to Good Friday, doesn't it? And even more, points us to Easter Sunday where Jesus reminds us, because I live, you too will live. And we have that promise that we can take these steps higher and higher with expectations of the Lord, of the promises that he gives to us. I can go higher and higher but let's stop for a moment and just come back to a comment that we made earlier. Is it possible that some of my expectations will not be met? 
Well, if our expectations is that our Lord is going to always answer yes to every one of our prayers, then that's not a biblical ex uh, expectation. It's not a biblical expectation that we're going to always have, uh, have life be filled with smiles and never have moments of pain. It's not a biblical expectation. But what is a biblical expectation? And ho helping us to climb the steps of life with higher and higher expectations is that even when those days will come, and they will, that he is going to be with us that we can count on him, that we can count on his promises, and we can count on the fact that our final expectation is going to be that he will take us home to himself because he is the life giver. We expect it.